Hello, friends. Welcome to World Build With Us, the podcast where we create fantastical worlds with help from you, our listeners. My name is Rob Hilferty, and I am here with Whiskered Weeaboo. Oh, come on. Chris Prunty, and our continued special guest, Daniel Quinn. I don't even own a waifu pillow. You literally own a uh, uh, Kikimori, though, so... Whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah, Those exactly. are just really warm. What is that? Don't worry about Don't it, Daniel. It's it weeaboo shit. Don't worry about it, Daniel. On today's episode of World Build With Us, we are continuing our deep dive into the Empire of Embers. In our second part of this two-part series, yes, there's two parts, we're going to be focusing on geography, points of interest, and the capital itself of the Empire of Embers. If you haven't listened to our last episode, why are you listening to this episode? That's Go back and listen to, to it. Yeah, have. it's a weird thing to do. Gentlemen, before we get going on today's episode, though, I do kind of want to talk about the idea that this podcast, what this podcast does. Because I came into the Empire of Embers with them being like a vaguely good, like kind of like a good guy nation state. They're that, still good. That was, kind of, yeah, that was kind of like transforming, right? But what we came into this episode last ep- or last week with was paranoia, authoritarian government, Palpatine, d- basically Emperor Palpatine, which I'm totally fine with. But I just love the fact that you come into these with a. Pers- I just love the evolution of the ideas as we continue on. Man, that's fun. Man, do I love that. And Daniel, what is your first geographical point that we wanted to get into? I wish uh, we we could get paid like in a writer's room. That would be really neat. I also wish I could get paid for this. Yeah, that'd be fun. <laughs> One day. If you're One day, hopefully. You guys aren't getting paid? Damn it. Who are you get? That is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> are you paying yourself? No. <laughs> it's my fans only page. Chris, yeah. this is... He has a special page. <laughs> that actually makes a lot of sense. I bet bears would go crazy oh. for you. Oh, my God. Oh God, Chris! The only thing you get paid on in this is attention. That's actually, which really for you is a currency in and of itself. So yeah, that's fair. All right, Daniel, please go right ahead. Um, Now (laughs) tell us about the geography of the Empire of Embers, please. Now the physical uh, solution for this is up in the air, um, but I'm imagining that during um, the original coup of the Emperor, the revolutionaries must have had some kind of. physical routes they use to sneak things around in order to overcome him. Um, so, it, it, you know, initially, obviously my mind goes to, like, tunnels, but that's kind of boring. So I'm wondering what? if no, something tun- else. Revolutionary tunnels are awesome! I mean, we could do tunnels. I just, I'm just no, leaving no, it open. Good, good, good. Yeah, yeah, I was thinking, like, rat tunnels okay, or something. Okay, no, okay, good, good, good. I'm, just, good. I'm leaving it open because I feel like it would be something that they had to have traveled through that was dangerous in order to get, you know, across massive areas that were controlled by the Emperor in order to get to the secret fortresses and all that. Okay. How about because yeah. we already in in last week we already established how there the, there's this massive uh like the, the the stone or metal that was being mined out yeah. and it was an uncertainty right how about those things just get abandoned mm-hmm. and that's what the rebels essentially use to kind of get around with and because no one's going to be i mean we can even add a component to where weird stuff happens in those tunnels yeah, I, weird I was, uh, Freaky shit happens in those tunnels. I was picturing the I was picturing the way that those tunnels are made up, kind of like literal veins of metal or stone. Yeah, where it's very biological, like a nervous system yeah, style. Yeah. Oh, I like spir- that. Spiraling out and everything. Ooh, I like yeah, that. I like that a lot too. So that's better than my. T- I wanted something that was cooler than tunnels. That's it. Okay, there we yeah. go. <laughs> All right, so we've got weird biological tunnels. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh, I'm still. Thi- oh, okay. Hold on. This is gonna have to go somewhere else but my brain is going that like the forgotten are antibodies in the monster that is the world <laughs> yes but we'll, we'll have to shelve that for now because man we're talking be about episode. the empire of embers right now episode. yeah exactly we're gonna have to talk about something like that actually i feel like the forgotten are kind of like growing to be this thing and in the earth it's or the the world itself is becoming this thing as well they're almost like but, a lithid's trademark you know oh, but not yeah. I, or Abolith. Yeah, they serve like a function, sort of. Like that. I think I think what you're thinking is like, uh, or were they Grimlocks or something like that? Ooh, yeah, the, oh, Grimlocks, no, no, no. you're they're right. The, yeah. They're the Githyanki and yeah. the Githzera. Githzera yeah. Wait, weren't yeah. they're, they're like rebels too. Weren't the Giths enslaved by yes. one of those? Well, they, the Giths, I think, they were, were like uh, slaves to the Illithids. Okay. Yes, yeah. they, yes, they were they're, slaves. They're, they're all of them are ancient Grimlocks, yeah. at the same time. Yes. Right, right. So yeah, we've got veins of the earth running through, acting as like 
rebel tunnels essentially hmm. i like that i think that we can definitely mess around with and I, i'm sure now the em- the emperor knows about this and uses it for his own purposes actually i i still think that they're probably used as rebel tunnels oh yeah although they're uh probably u- i don't know that's that's or maybe kind of both a good point. it could be both yeah maybe there are some that like maybe the rebels know of so- because because it's like such a weird like literal labyrinth yeah why not have it be both where you'll have a cops and robbers They're style like extra of like, dangerous. Because yeah, of like it. it's like a tunnel rats type situation yeah. where, or, or no, uh, there's a, a famous battle uh, in, in in Austria where there are two sapper teams, you know, <laughs> digging in opposite directions. One's trying to get towards the castle to kind of take down the walls, and the other ones are trying to get around uh, to get behind enemy forces. And there were times where as they were digging. They literally dig into each other's tunnels. How? First of all, that's terrifying. That all of a sudden you just poke out into an enemy tunnel, Oops. and now you're fighting with shovels and like short, like, like horrible. I believe that also happened in World War One uh, on the French and German fronts because they would try and dig out into the middle, and then somehow they'd be like, "Do you hear shovels?" Oh man, that's so crazy! I love that so much. Okay, yeah, that's totally a thing that we're throwing in there now. Kill. Okay. okay. I mean, this. What's important is that when you play in this particular part of the campaign, make sure you have a tunneling skill. Yeah, uh, Earthwalk. Uh, actually, that would yeah. be helpful as well. Oh, yeah. mm-hmm. But we'd have to talk about that at some point. Anyway, Chris, do you have something to add to geography? Yes, and I have no idea where it is. Okay. But I figure uh, making all of these things out of God hearts, burning all of these things. I wanted a mountain of ash. Okay. I wanted some sort of. Uh, slag or something that is the remainder of god hearts when they are forged together yeah those are called monsters uh <laughs> like, like let's be real those things are walking monstrosities for I, sure no i get that but i'm talking about like the ash the debris mm-hmm. and one of the things that i wanted was just uh well what i have here is the mountain of uh the field of roses and the grave of the gods sorry the field of what the field of roses and okay. the grave of the gods Okay, I can I can get behind both of those ideas. I'm thinking of like slag and and god runoff creating walking mountains, aka giants. Oh, ooh. yeah, because it's because of course the empire doesn't necessarily know how to deal with runoff and slag much much in the way that the caliphate kind of dealt with their stuff as well. So what happened in the caliphate? We had runoff into like this chaos spring, and so what happens here is. A similar idea, except it's a little bit more Earth-related. And so we have giants and titans. They're like mage yeah. dooms. Do you remember those? Ma- what now? There's a monster in D&D called a mage doom, which is like alchemical runoff come oh, to I life. I heard mage dune. dune. Yeah, I also yeah. heard dune as well. D-O-O-N. Shout out to Henry Zabrowski, by the way. <laughs> um, no, but I was thinking like literal walking mountains and stuff Ooh, like, that, like where, that, where this is the closest thing to an elemental you'll probably see because yeah. it's... It's like primal god heart stuff that's just kind of mixed with a river that flows through it and then the sludge of the earth that kind of goes through it as well. And then I think, Chris, what you're getting at is when you have... Uh, I, I First of all, I love the idea of a of a, a graveyard of of god hearts. For some, like, you know, in, in the Caliphate, they have their tower that's essentially that of subjugation. And and this is even better. Go ahead and expand on that. That's awesome. So uh, the graveyard of the graveyard of God hearts or the graveyard of gods. My main thing was these are burnt husk. This are ashen husk of God hearts and everything, or the remains of them. And I just pictured a gigantic field of roses, and I tried to look up other flowers and everything that really uh, grow out of ash really well. Uh, but roses was the most uh, iconic thing that, that oh. was there. That's cool. Can we make them a specific color? Yeah, yeah. What? Because because I I'm thinking white roses for some reason rather than red. Mm-hmm. Although we could also do purple or black or whatever. But what do you think? I'll let, I mean, what do you guys think? What do you think would be the best cool color for roses? They're your roses. They, I know they're my roses, but my idea is stupid. Which what? Which is, is it? Rainbow roses? Octarine. Octarine. Mm-hmm. Yes. What okay. Is Isn't that a racial slur? Not that I'm aware of, an apology to anyone who Any is out there. Out yeah, there. Octarines. But no, it. one of your least favorite authors, I believe, Terry Pratchett. I have nothing against Terry Pratchett. He's just not for me in any way. 
they describe it as kind of like a neon green black that oh, uh, That's magic cool. With like veins of green in it. Yeah. Uh, I know it's. It, I know exactly the type of green that you're. you're yeah. Like. Okay. Uh, like, I I don't like that, but I accept that. <laughs> Much like I don't like Terry Pratchett, but I accept it's that people like It's almost like they're like poisonous. Him. I bet if you eat one of these, it's a bad idea. Oh, I don't think that would be a good idea. Yeah, probably, I, don't, yeah. I don't think you should eat roses, no. for that matter. But. Actually, that kind of makes sense in terms of like a poisoner's guild, if you want to think about like yeah. the deadliest poison being made up from this. It's like, a gr- it's like it is going to be essentially like a graveyard of gods, but it's also going to be a secret and, and basically like my secret garden, but of all incredibly deadly poisonous plants. And then, of course, from that, we have a poisoner's guild that comes from that. You can make amazing cocktails, too. Oh, yeah, like you'll kind of die, but then the cocktail's so good. <laughs> yeah. you know, Wait, no, it. the resurrection. It's yeah. so good, you it's worth die. dying Oh, for. my God, that's so yes. dumb and amazing. Yes. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, I can support this. <laughs> I can support this. Oh okay. God, I can see so many people. Imagine yeah. if you knew you could come back. You're like, well, I've lived a good life. Time to find out what blowfish tastes like. The, the reforge carried on their persons because what do they care? They're just gonna keep resurrected. Mm. Oh man, yeah, I like the idea of which like, oh yeah, we're gonna coat this and we're gonna coat this in uh, this this god poison, and you're gonna die. There you go. Oh. Uh, okay. So oh, all right. So I think we talked about the overall geographical landscape pretty well in our last episode, you know, like where it's, it's pretty expansive and it changes and there's actually kind of two climates that we talked about. So that's good. I like what we're adding here in geographical points of interest. One thing that I love, especially from Japanese history are, uh, mountain fortresses. I don't, so back in, uh, I think it was, uh, warring States era, maybe, there were just the Nobunaga era. Think that it was the kind of place where there were fortresses of monks, warrior monks, and they were impregnable. Like no one would fuck with these warrior monks. They tried. Don't get me wrong. They tried, but they, no one could beat these warrior monks. And so of course I'm thinking we got forges. We've got Mount. I want big mountain fortresses and one fortress in particular where it's, 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 it never fell to the rebellion. It was always loyal to the emperor and it's like just been this bastion and something's going on there. I don't know what it is. I don't know whether or not they are staying loyal to the same emperor or they're like, I don't know what it is, but it's kind of like this thing that they're way off over there. And one other thing that's going to actually allow me to transition into my point of interest along with geography chris you mentioned you wanted a big ash mountain for the gods and everything like Mm -hmm. that i wanted the same thing how about that yeah but i wanted my mountain to be bigger to be a (laughs) volcano i wanted my mountain to be a volcano because i love dormant volcanoes that you can use the heat of the lava as something else, or you can use the caldera as something else. That to me is one of my favorite fantasy tropes and and like fantastical elements. Because you know me, I'm you all about like- You want to lower things into the volcano. Yeah. It's just sitting there. Yeah. Like Terminator. No, but like, you know me, like I'm all about like, well, let's talk about the economics of like what it means to use silver. And oh, let's talk about the economic trade of chickens in a fantasy world. No, God. sometimes I just want a cool volcano where I can forge God hearts and this will tie into everything where it's, yeah, I want a cool, I, it, it's called the primal forge where this is a giant volcano it is where the god of the forge originates, and it is, it's not where the god heart is anymore, but this is where he's from, and this is what happened. This is where god hearts started to become relics, where they're using the heat of the volcano, they're using the weird metal earth stuff that's around to, to forge and create the relics, and they're sundering god souls apart as black smooth, like black plumes of smoke erupt from the volcano and like lightning strikes down and god damn it he's gonna have a heart attack yeah. that's what i want <laughs> sometimes you just gotta have a cool 
villainous volcano in your fantasy world. And it's just the shape of a skull. No, <laughs> no it's not Mountain Doom. <laughs> I mean, the minute you said, like, mountain fortresses, I was sold because it's such a visually striking image, you know, like, and it's not, you know, like, your typical, I mean, granted, yes, you've got Mount Doom, so there's a whole typical kind of, like, fantasy trope of the volcano, but here, we've already created a setting that has, um, this, this wintry, um, like untouchable landscape with these giant trees and fields of these roses. So it only makes sense that you've got even bigger, you know, stranger, um, you know, like natural edifices. Yeah. And, and two, th two things that I like about it is speaking about your mountain fortress doom, I forget what ancient temples or actual fortresses, but they carved it from literal rock. Like they didn't transport stone there, but they like, carved into the mountain and made it very natural and very strong by that. It, were you picturing it as a worked kind of stone thing of where they transported bricks and built it up or like... There's a place in Poland where there's a giant salt cave and inside the salt cave, uh, years and years, artisans have carved a, a temple, a, a, a monastery out of salt to be closer with God because people thought that when you spoke into the earth, especially salt, because it has uh, purity. purity, that's what it was. That's essentially the idea that I have, at least for the Primal Forge, because these are people who aren't, you. they don't need to use worked stone mm -hmm. because they're already, they already have it in abundance. So they're literally carving the mountain. They're, they're literally carving the mountain into a fortress. Hmm. Yeah. Guys, volcanoes are cool. Yeah, volcanoes are <laughs> I don't cool. know what to tell you. Like, you have, like, zero objections here. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Let's... All right, so that was my point of interest. I kind of transitioned from geography to point of interest. Who wants to hit me with their point of interest next? Let's go there. Okay. So, you you touched a lot on something that I wanted to do. I, I wanted to do a, uh, a armory reliquary, and I wanted to do a uh, blacksmithing place. So... Apparently can't do those. <laughs> I'm not going to do those. But I feel like something that we haven't touched on is the new age. Age of the gun. Mm -hmm. Something of uh, armor smiths kind of uh, coming out. From, well, weapon smiths coming out of that. And I currently don't want to mix them with God. Yeah, no, I, 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 like, I prefer that idea as well. Okay, okay, good. good. You know, we, we kind of talked about the idea that new gods can form... Uh, do we want to stick with that idea or can we have new things come up like technology and gunpowder and stuff like that and have there kind of be a hard delineation between the two? So these are essentially quote unquote new gods, but it's really just gunpowder and technology. Or do we want to stick with the idea that these are, there is a God of guns and a God of gunpowder, but it's like a, a weird kind of American God situation. Mm. Yeah, I, I get that, but I'm not sure if right now it's being breathed into existence, especially, but it does take a very neat role in this country of all places of where if a new God were to emerge, the emperor is going to be like, oh, I'm going to snuff that down. Oh, it's a God of gunpowder. I kind of need that though. I See, I don't even necessarily see the emperor snuffing out gods because he'll just subjugate them. Like... You can have a new god, but as long as it's following your rules and following your, it like, is willing to bend the knee, so to speak, I don't see why they can't coexist. Mm. I mean, um, how does, so like, if we think about the cosmology you established with the gods in multiple um, planes of existence, like, how would it, how would it work if a new one is created? That's kind of the problem that I have, because we've already established that there's essentially an infinite spider web of, of gods and everything like that, right? Or, or these are like foundational aspects in the multi-universe. So how does that happen? Are they already there? It's just a matter of they're just now starting to tear into that part of the universe. Or perhaps is it something like the primal version of this is different, or, or maybe it's a matter of you're not understanding that God correctly. And now that we're starting to develop the technology for it, you can start to put a name to the thing. And so what once was like, what's this weird sulfur God? I don't understand it. It doesn't have much power. Then that sulfur God kind of transforms into a gunpowder God. And so now you're, st maybe it's just a matter of attention. Maybe the gods are already there because this isn't anything new to them, right? Mm -hmm. 
It's a matter of, we've always existed. You've just started to recognize our power, that kind of thing. Yeah, for the most part, the way that I see either a god coming about or growing in power is how many people are literally putting their faith in that god. Mm -hmm. So the more mm -hmm. people put their faith in steel and gun, the less... The, the more powerful that god will become. Or if enough gets concentrated where there's more people believing in that, it, it may forge into an actual kind of heart. We haven't done any sort of origin story for that kind of thing. We really haven't. That's but, like, imagine if one day a guy's making a gun and it's just like, bing! I mean, the question it raises is, is it seems like this whole setting... Um, depends on supernatural ability coming from some form of God or being derived from gods. The question becomes like, does the future break that paradigm or does it just perpetrate it? And either one can work, I guess, but it's a question for the setting, right? Land of a Thousand Gods, 2099. Next episode. Yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> oh yeah. What, what's up, Miguel O'Hara, right? Um, no, what I was thinking as we, this is way back when we were talking about this concept, but the idea that the gods already existed and then they only started to resonate with like power once people started to recognize them and started to worship them essentially the gods have no power without the worshipers but at the same time worshipers create the gods through their belief right yeah so it's it's this is like a really complicated and tricky issue that i feel like we're we're still kind of working on but i think that the, th the thread that we have, the core idea is there enough where we can, because ca my whole love affair with the concept is the fact that it's all up to the mortal interpretation. The gods are kind of this weird, hyper advanced alien intelligence that exists throughout every multiplane. And so it's up to the humans to try and understand what that is. And so when they start to worship fire, that's not actually the god of fire, or maybe it is. It's up to their interpretation as to what they're worshiping. I even have concepts to where, you know, there is a... When when you worship one type of fire, it's it's just the same god. So, like, gunpowder could be earth, could mm. be salt, could be steel. It's all the same god. It's just how we, or mortals, rather, interpret that god. God's influence. In and since you are still worshiping a forging God. Exactly. So that's, that's kind of the concept that I have that I'm kind of playing around with. But man, like I said, it's, it's a fairly complex issue that we gotta, it's gotta figure it out in general, or, or I'll actually just leave it up to interpretation mm. for the people who are writing or, or playing in this particular setting. I think that's interesting as well. And I think that that's actually an important kind of aside to have midway through this episode, because you know, it's it's an important aspect. Mm -hmm. But let's try and get back on track. Uh, your point of in your point your your oh wow hold on, hold yeah on. your point of interest was my point of interest was going to be the reliquary forge in the capital of where they keep their arms and armor and all of the oh an armory yeah okay the oh but but like an armory specifically for relics yes. Okay. Yes. Okay, understood. So it's where they keep all the one like uh I'm I was picturing like when they hand this out, it's a very ceremonial thing. It's not like they give it out to everyone. It's usually a, a bit of uh like the reason you're getting this is due to service for the empire. We plan to either have it back or this becomes your family heirloom. I like that idea. I I, I feel like there's a lot to work with there. I, I I want something else to it though. I I want there to be like something else to it besides. Is it a vault? Like what are we working with here exactly? Uh, so to expand upon my idea, one of the other things that I had is going back to uh, I believe you you brought them up uh, the retainers. Yeah. I picture imagine uh, there is a legacy behind each one of these items that goes beyond just the gods that uh, they were forged from, but also from the characters that held them. And in order to even be thought of in this, in the, in the correct sense, you have to kind of enter in there and you'd be like, I plan on taking up this station. Maybe I plan on being a monster hunter or something with this. You will give me uh, the blade that was owned by this person before them. It was owned by this person before this person. It was 
uh, owned by another, and before that, it was a god. Like, if you think, it's almost like a bank for legacies. So, like, this reliquary has an accounting ledger, really, of the histories of all these items that can only be doled out if you continue that legacy, if you transact with it. I, I was actually thinking, I'm like, okay, if you're going to do it like this, where we have all the relics, we need scribes, and we need, like, an account mm-hmm. of, it's it's not just a basement where they have, like, a plus yeah. one sword. <laughs> it's a matter of, this is a vault, and there are scribes who have scrolls, and you have to read through... Maybe you have to do something like respect the history and maybe it's a matter of it's not just that you get this weapon because you're a strong fighter. It's like you have to sit and learn the history of it and the history of the people who wielded it. And it's a matter of respecting your history, respecting the, the and the, so it's not just a matter of a dumb, strong guy yeah. who can fight good using a sword. It's like, no, we want fighters who are better than that it's a whole it's like 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 a noble order of knights almost Mm -hmm. Uh, but 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 not necessarily knights like they don't necessarily have to be like that i didn't know what to call them but knights was right Mm -hmm. actually i mean we could even call them like an order of knights but but have them be full of like weaklings or, or philosophers and stuff like that they don't necessarily have to prove themselves by fighting although We've already established that they're big on military, so maybe it is a strictly military... This is like the Emperor's Sorting Hat. This whole facility. Oh, my God. <laughs> Dan, you're going to get kicked off. Speaking, I swear, I mean, speaking as someone who does not read Harry Potter. Hey, hey Go hey, to your corner. Hey, hey, Chris, I realize why we keep calling Daniel our special <laughs> guest. It's because now we can just cut him loose at any point so we don't have to have him back. You That's really... You know you like it. Palpatine, yeah. Harry Potter, it's all I'm bringing. Oh, God damn it. Okay, but no, I, li- I like the idea that this isn't just... I-, I like the idea that the history brings with each relic. I think that's a really cool twist. I forget uh, if you've read The Dark Tower. Oh, I love it. Oh, you- do you remember when uh, Roland got his guns and the like ceremony of him yeah, getting that? Okay, that's cool. the yeah, kind yeah. of thing that I'm picturing of where it's just like, these are your father's... Honor code this was too, your father's yeah. weapon. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, you have first right to claim this as yours. Yeah. The prequel books really covered that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I didn't read the prequel books. Well, like the, I guess they're the, like the cabin in between, because essentially. Stephen but... King keeps yes. writing books. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, he's very prolific. I only saw the movie. That That's good enough, oh, right? Oh, God. I'm <laughs> joking. I'm, <laughs> the look on both your faces is worth that. Oh, man. All right, Daniel, what's your point of interest? Go well, ahead. So this ties that. perfectly into what you were just describing. If, if this... this um, the place where the, relic, the relics are kept is a reliquary that has um, cultural significance and also like a legacy that's handed off. My idea was military academies. So if you're in an advanced kind of empire, um, like you were saying, they don't just want you know your average soldier. They want one who's erudite and who's skilled um, and who's been trained in a certain like ethos and philosophy. So I'm thinking that there are mil- military academies throughout um, the empire that have different pedigrees, um, different you know, pre- prestige and different renown. And so people who serve the emperor want to go to the, the right academy, get the right education, so then they can go to that bank and get the right relic to be part of the empire. Yeah. Um, oh, wait, we could even have the academies be- part of... So each academy ha- is is in charge of its own set of relics or something like that. So depending on which academy you go to, you get a different set of relics. To the choose relics from. that they have can also shape their militaristic philosophy yes. as far as just like, all right, we focus on defense because we got a lot of armor mm-hmm. or or something. Oh, that's brilliant. Yeah. That's that's a really fun and. It, now I'm thinking of like every academy is basically a Professor X academy, where you get like a super, you get like a super cool item at the end of it type like a, thing, like a wand. Oh. <laughs> I'm also picturing like a, it's a badge of your station. You you're an officer in the military. Here's your right. That's yeah. a good point. That's like a maybe a little point. bit higher than like. You know, you're not a corporal. You're maybe a lieutenant or a captain. Yeah. Well, and it goes back to how you wanted to be able to tell um, s- stories almost of the Empire being good guys, right? Like, that's where you started? Yeah. Like, if you've got young knights who they've, you know, they grew up in the philosophy of the Empire. Like, that, if you have, like, young knights who have grew up in the philosophy of the Empire, like, they're, they don't know the great grand scheme of things for the Emperor and all the awful things he's up to. They because believe in the future of the Empire. They're and idealist. Be- and, and not only that, but the, all they've done is study the history, which is often often written by the winner like they're reading the propaganda version of the history of the blade or the relic or 
of the of the item that they're using. So of course they're coming into it with a bit of naivete. That's actually that's a great point to bring up. Let's not uh, avoid the subject that we're calling them good guys, and yet they have a bunch of relics. And they got the relics by literally smashing god hearts apart. I think they're good guys. Yeah, no, I know, but that's you. And also, um, let's just not be like, hey, they're literally murdering aspects of the gods here and kind of cramming them into a wrench so the wrench works better. I just want to make sure that we are, where it's not like people aren't there, aren't be like, well, these guys are dumb. They think they're the good guys and they're murdering gods and destroying civilizations. Yeah, no, you don't get to be an empire that big without smashing some god hearts apart. I have only played good characters. That is not well, even remotely Whenever we true. say, like, good guys, we I mean, in my case, I particularly mean, like, from the perspective of the actor. Yeah, I think that that's, a, that's a very good point. I think that's, that's my point as well, is that we want to make sure that when we say good guys, we don't mean, like... They're literal genocidal monsters. We mean that there's some redeeming quality within them. And also the fact that we have to deal with this is a different time period than what we're used to. So conquest is still a, an acceptable form of living and being in that time. So I just want to point that out real quick. I, for one, believe in the nation of embers and think that they have a right Personally. to if you believed them, and you, if you believed in them, you'd understand their name properly. So I was going even for if it's a placeholder. Yeah, son of a bitch. Uh huh. Uh huh. <laughs> Got you. Took the wind out of my sails. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, so is this is so far this has all been kind of like point of interest and also in the capital itself. So let's go ahead and transition over into the capital. Mine's a really simple one. Um, I, I kind of wanted to stay away from a military aspect. I kind of wanted to stay away from something that's overtly evil. So I wanted to go with something that's uncommon in this era for sure, which is streetlights. I want there to be lamps because again, God of the forge and technology, of course you can have like a literal fire running underneath the ground and everything like that and poking up and, they're, they're essentially braziers or sconces where it's not like a street lamp that's like got a candle in it or, or whatever it was, or oil lamp in it, and it's being turned on and turned off. Like, no, these are essentially eternally burning braziers that light the way and are essentially acting as gaslight for for the nightlife of other people. You know, that that's the idea that I had where it's, we didn't get gaslight, gaslighting and gas. Uh, gas lanterns until much later on but in this city in particular you don't have to worry about that we got you you're actually safe to walk around at night relatively speaking you're just gonna get you know a treatment of gaslighting yeah i guess yeah. i mean you never said that <laughs> son of a bitch <laughs> uh yeah i think it's it's i think it's an innocuous thing but i also think that Having lighting at night is one of those things that you really only appreciate uh, uh, until it's, uh, well. Oh, it can get fucking dark. Yeah, you only appreciate it when it's gone, I suppose, is the, is, because imagine walking around a city at night. Yeah, no problem. There's a bunch of lights everywhere. Now imagine walking around that same city at night with no lights on. You're now suddenly 20% more terrified than you used to be. I mean, it's, it's emblematic of the progress of the empire, right? Like something so small, but something that's a convenience that shows, wow, we're this much more, quote unquote, advanced, you know, than other civilizations and that we've, you know, laid out our roads in a particular way to even have the lighting. You exactly. Know? Those yeah. basic things like plumbing, maybe they had, I don't know if they have plumbing, but something like something like that, like is a big difference than other civilizations potentially. Yeah. And not, I mean, again, safety of the people who are in the empire, you know, you're literally, uh, blanketing the night with beacons of safety, so to speak. You know, I know that's really corny as fuck, but, you know, that's basically what you're doing. It's back to Herzog's little statement. Yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah. Mandal Man, the Mandalorian is really it's good. so freaking huh? good. It's so much better than any other thing yeah. Star Wars has come out with in the last, like, 50 years. So true. Uh, 40? Yeah, 40. Uh, 40. <laughs> 2020 minus... So you mean Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I guess I'm talking about Kurosawa, so maybe... Can I say something controversial? I think the Mandalorian... No, Daniel! I think the Mandalorian might actually be better than the original OG trilogy. trilogy? Yeah, I think it does it. Oh. I think it does the OG trilogy better than the trilogy. But it let's, wouldn't hold on. exist without it. Let's, true, true. let's just say that it's 
better than some of the original trilogy. Sure, I can live with that. Because Return of the Jedi exists. Yeah, I can live with that. Live okay, with that. cool. Sorry. All right, uh, who wants to go next? What else What else is interesting about the Capitol? Let's go there. So, originally when I brought up uh, my kind of point of interest, I was saying I was saying the Forbidden City kind of aspect of it. Yeah. Uh, rather than uh, just say that again, I would... <laughs> I I would build upon that concept of one other thing that exists that not many people see, and I was going to say the uh, the Emperor's Garden. Oh, that's fun. The same thing. Oh, you son of a bitch! No, this is my thing. We can work on it together. And part of my thing was going to be the fact of the plants that are there, going back again to those special roses and everything. It just like it's fertilized with a little bit of God. Yeah. Oh, okay. I, I like the idea of the garden for me because I thought of it as kind of like a, an anti-military sort of thing. It was like something peaceful in the middle of a place that's potentially dangerous, right? Close to the emperor. Yeah, you can even have one of those uh, pits of ash that are raked kind of thing. Yeah, oh, wow. Like and that's how they till like the gardens there. That's yeah. cool. I like that, yeah. And I also thought of it as a place where, you know, the diplomats of the empire or the um, officials, like that's where they have a lot of their communications in secret because it's so close to the emperor mm. and it's protected mm. so if it's a place you want to spy on the empire it would be those gardens yeah and also uh one of the things that we haven't touched on in some of these is i always love when a game can go from especially in this one that's super militaristic if you were to just do it in court politics yeah of where oh, suddenly totally. it's just like oh let's go to the rose garden and mm-hmm. just like yeah. That's that's what I wanted. Yeah, definitely kind of the, the propaganda techniques are developed there, but also like you know the whispers that are only meant for the emperor are said there. I think it's Legends of the Five Rings that has like that entire th- intrigue and politics. Yeah, yeah. where yeah. where you're just like, oh, you can be a badass samurai, but my god, you have no idea what's going on in this dinner setting, and you look like an idiot. Exactly. Yeah, and you're bringing dishonor to your oh, shogun yeah. by doing so. Especially yeah. because someone else can see what you're doing. Daimyo. Sorry, Daimyo, not yeah. shogun. Yeah, yeah, I got what you meant. But, you know, good point. Cover yourself. Um, other people there can point it out, and then you're just, you take damage from the amount of shame yep. that you feel. Absolutely. Just like, oh, is, is that how you were taught to eat? And it's just like, <laughs> <laughs> That actually brings up an interesting point. Uh, what are the people of the Empire of Embers like? Because I feel like the, the capital is pretty much well taken care of. I feel like you got a pretty strong sense of that area. But we really haven't talked about the people outside of like the Emperor himself. What are some stereotypes and uh, general traits that you can come away from? I imagine uh, that the people in the Empire of Embers are very proud people. And I mean that in like a nationalistic sense and also in an individual level. I think that you want to talk about honor and personal honor. I think that's actually a really big deal for them where it's like, you will not besmirch my emperor and you will not besmirch me. Like, and then duels happen. Like that's, Ooh. that's kind of what I think happens. I mean, I can also see there being, um, pockets cause it's such a large empire of the people who were originally subject to their conquests. So whoever was native to that land before the empire developed into an empire, like maybe they're like fundamentally culturally different. But they abide by kind of the strictures of the empire now. Oh, that's really cool because you can kind of see like there's there's a diff like a there's a definitive cultural divide between the citizens of the empire and the barbarians. Exactly. You know, to, to kind of go back to like the Roman yeah. bar bar bar. That's what I was thinking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that. To, and I, I want there to be like maybe it's like a style of dress or something uh-huh. like that, where it's you know the 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 empire is. Their dress is a little bit more militaristic. Even the peasants, even the people who are like not even in the military, there's something about keeping up appearances to make sure that the empire looks good is a really important aspect of it. I mean, maybe if we want to go back to whole the whole like gunslinger slash um, you know age of weapons thing, maybe the cultural natives, quote unquote, or people who are like mountaineering types or rangery types who lived like in those woods. Um, you know, the, like kind of the the wintry slash uncultured lumberjack, <laughs> and so like they have more of a tie to um, you know mining the earth and to understanding the earth than the people of the empire do now. But one of the things I want to avoid because I hate when this sometimes happens in uh, any kind of setting, it's where the capital is all like 
prim, proper. They're they have no nothing about salt of the earth about them, and then they just shit upon where they get their resources. Yeah, and they're no. just like, oh god, you freaking barbarians! By the way, thanks for all of the resources that we depend on every day. Okay, yes, I agree with that. I want there to be a little bit of that though. Where it's like you can tell that there's a disconnect between the two, but it's also there's a unified front where everyone in the Empire, even if you're a lumberjack, even if you're like a mountain man, you still got to look good. Like that's kind of the thing. Like okay. it, it's yeah. not prissy. They're not prissy folks. They're practical and they think that appearance matters. Kind of like in, in like real life military, shine your boots. Mm-hmm. You know, like don't disrespect what you're wearing and who you're representing that's who that's not just you who you are you know like stuff like that i mean the the coup likely um unified citizens with um kind of the quote-unquote country folk or mining folk because they would have both joined together against the empire to some degree to when that happened and the monster hunter guilds as well Mm -hmm. so maybe there's an aspect of you know it's kind of it's kind of trendy to be slightly disheveled or it's like an act of rebellion to be like my hair's must just a little bit or you know what I didn't even iron this shirt today. You know, like stuff like that where it's like minor acts of rebellion are actually a big deal and only they would kind of understand it. Um, What other kind of cultural aspects do you see them? Like what other traits? Like if you were to play a character, if you were to write a character from the Empire, what would you write about them to be like, "This, this is definitively about them that's from the Empire? Even if they don't agree with the Emperor... If a foreigner were to say something against their country, that's where, of course, they get, like, just like... I can talk shit about my family. You can't talk shit about my family. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Maybe the rebel types prefer, um, you know, to use technology, weapons, armor, and stuff that's slightly, you know, used or has some... That's not fresh. And so they prefer, like, maybe a battered weapon to one that's, like, completely newly forged. Mm. That's kind of interesting. Also... I'm thinking techno rebels for some reason, like, and that just brings up all sorts of silly techno nonsense. Vikings. Uh, oh, I'm I love techno Viking. Talk about early internet shit. My God, good old. I think that's where we're gonna go out. I think we're gonna go out on techno Viking today because God bless you, techno Viking. Like really, I don't know where he is, but I hope he's doing well. Yeah, I hope he I hope he runs some kind of weird like CrossFit. Yeah, techno yeah. Viking. Workout. Center. I want him to be a small business owner who still looks exactly the same, except slightly pudgier. But anyway, even more chiseled. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The older he gets, the more rigid he becomes. Eventually, evolving into a statue. <laughs> he, he's already an Adonis. Anyway, that's gonna do it for this week, uh, and our that's gonna conclude our deep dive on the Empire of Embers. If we missed anything. If you think that we have forgotten some vastly important topic, go ahead and send us an email at worldbuildwithus at gmail.com and let us know. Ow. Goodbye. Uh, I have been Rob Hilferty here with Chris Prunty and Daniel Quinn. Remember that we love you very much and we will see you next week. Snooches.